Um, first, thank you uh, for being here today to uh, hear the update on, on where we are. Obviously, um, this has moved forward at lightning speed on lots of levels. So as it relates to the two suspects that were charged, the parents that were charged by our prosecutor, Karen McDonald, um, <clears throat> as you know, we activated a manhunt um, when charges were issued um, to locate them immediately. Our partner from the United States Marshal Eastern District, Owen Cyphers here, um, they along with a lot of partners, quite frankly, uh, immediately went into action in addition to our fugitive apprehension team their teams, um, Detroit Police was amazing, and we can get into that more. Um, obviously, we had the FBI involved, Michigan State Police. Uh, we even had helicopter assistance from the United States Border Patrol. So everybody pitched in. Uh, we were confident we'd be able to find them in short order, and because of that teamwork, we did. So we were notified by Detroit. They had received a tip that the vehicle had been seen. Uh, we were notified at 2305, which is 11.05 p.m., our fugitive folks uh, arrived on scene with Detroit at 2325, which is um, 1125, uh, just 20 minutes after the call. They arrived downtown uh, Detroit to be with Detroit. Detroit had seen the car, had secured the scene, had established a perimeter, done some great police work. Um, ultimately, at approximately 1.30 in the morning, the two suspects were taken into custody at 11 Bellevue in Detroit in a commercial vehicle. They were in an art studio within that uh, building that has multiple kinds of partitions, if you will, in that building. Uh, they were taken in custody, as I said, at about 1.30 in the morning. Our fugitive apprehension team uh, took custody and possession of them, and they were formally lodged in our jail where they remain at about uh, 0300, about 3 o'clock in the morning. So they are in our jail, um, all three of them, the son and both parents. They are segregated, each individually, in isolation. Uh, we have uh, advanced watch on them. There is no indicator that any of them, we always have every person that comes in an intake evaluated by counselors and classification to determine if there's any threats to themselves or anyone else. Uh, there was no indication that any of them were suicidal, but out of an abundance of caution. Our amazing corrections team is doing suicide watches on all three of them. So uh, they are in custody and again in isolation. So uh, that's a good step. Uh, the further on as it goes to this, uh, we believe, and I've had uh, multiple communications with Chief White of Detroit, our great partner, and another, again, shout out to his team for what they did, how they did it. Um, and we've been in conversation and talking about some of the now follow-on information and evidence that we have. We believe they were assisted in that uh, location to get there, to get in. And uh, we're gathering that information. And we're going to have the totality of that done fairly soon uh, and present that to our prosecutor for potential charges for either uh, um, aiding and abetting or uh, obstruction of justice. So that will be a determination by our prosecutor at some point in, uh, in the near future, and that is a work in progress with all the other works in progress. Um, <clears throat> again, you know, every time I get a chance, I want to throw out there to the public if they have any information on either of these two or the individual, the, the shooter, please either contact us at OCSO, Oakland County Sheriff's Office, OCSO at oakgov.com, or call us at 248 858 4911. Uh, any information, again, about either the actions in the school, preceding the actions in the school, or the follow on as it relates to the two parents. Um, and, of course, you can be confidential or pass it on in any way uh, that you see fit. I know. Uh, Mr. Marshall from the United States Eastern District, you want to mention something there? Yeah. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, 
Good afternoon. My name is Owen Seifer. I'm the U.S. Marshal for the Eastern District of Michigan. Um, I would just like to say thank you uh, on behalf of the United States Marshal Service to the uh, Sheriff's Office here in Oakland County. Uh, Sheriff Bouchard and his team have always been phenomenal. We've always had a terrific partnership uh, with the Detroit Fugitive Apprehension Team and his staff. Uh, our officers responded uh, the moment that we got the tip that the vehicle had been found in Detroit. Uh, and, and we had units out working all day yesterday and last night they converged on the scene and were able to help uh, the Detroit Police Department take those su uh, subjects into custody. I would also like to thank uh, Chief White and his team down in Detroit. They did a phenomenal job of identifying the vehicle, locating uh, the subjects in, a, in a, a building that they believed they were in. As soon as we had enough uh, personnel on, staff, on site to uh, search the, that building, we did so. We executed the warrants and uh, thankfully no one was hurt in the apprehension of these two individuals and they are now safely in custody. So uh, great thanks to Sh uh, Chief White and to Sheriff Richard and the uh, Oakland County Sheriff's Office, Detroit uh, and Oakland County. They've always been great partners with the Marshal Service and we truly appreciate that. So thank you, Sheriff. Thank you. Um, I think that's really most of what the questions have been about so far today. Anybody else have any other questions? What, did, uh, did either of the parents say anything either on that drive from Detroit to the jail or once they arrived at the jail? Have they said anything to you? Yeah, probably at this point we're not going to talk about any either evidence that may uh, be presented. So that information will be turned over to the prosecutor and anything about that will be forthcoming as it relates to you know trial activities. The Crumley's attorneys basically described this as a miscommunication and said they were planning to turn themselves in. Is that a possibility? Well, all I know is this, is that uh, when we were informed we had an active warrant for them, uh, there was some communication that came in to one of our detectives that said that they were going to uh, arrange for their arrest to turn themselves in. And, you know, that's fine. We don't wait for that. When we have um, serious charges like felonies, you can turn yourself in, you can go to court, you can come to any one of our substations, but we're going to go look for you immediately. And so we triggered, uh, once the warrant was in hand, a full activation of, of looking for them because there's a lot more tools at our disposal once we have a warrant. And we had been uh, looking for them prior to that, but it was in a much more limited fashion, and that's the most I'm going to say about our investigative techniques. But, um, you know, then later in the morning, we had communication that the uh, the couple was not responding to texts or phone calls of their attorney. So again, to us, that's irrelevant. We're looking for them. If they show up, fine. But we're not going to sit you know, at the front desk and tap our fingers until they come in. We were out actively looking for them, working with our partners, and they were taken into custody before that question was asked or answered. Were they actually going to do it? I don't know. But given that they were hiding in a warehouse in Detroit, it certainly raises my eyebrows. Why were they in Detroit to begin with? That's part of the questions, obviously, why they were there, why they were in a, a commercial building in, a, in that form and fashion. Uh, we had located their other vehicle at a different location you know, prior to the warrant even being issued. You know, as I said, we began a process of doing what we could before any warrants were in hand to look for them. And we found one other family vehicle at a different location, but they weren't there and there was no connectivity to them being there at that moment. Sheriff, can you, can you give some clarity <coughs> as to how you know that they were hiding? Couldn't they say, just say they were in the building? Were they specifically <coughs> ducked away or anything like that? Well, when the tip came in, the person was apparently outside smoking and they pretty much ran away. And obviously, um, the way, and I'm not going to get into specifics, but I think where they were and how they were seems to support the position they were hiding and they weren't looking for surrendering at that point. Sir, what are, what are the criminal ramifications for people that help them in that art gallery and what are they looking at crime-wise? Have the people that help them been taken into custody and are they cooperating? Well, we obviously don't have any charges at this point, um, but that's part of the investigation and ultimately if there are charges that are applicable that will be uh, the prosecutor's decision so we're trying to put together as much detailed information on that as it relates to that uh, suffice to say we have enough early indications that clearly somebody helped them into that location and made it available to them 
and it was after it was publicly announced that there were warrants for them. How much do you know about their whereabouts from Friday morning when they made this ATM withdrawal to the point where their cell phone shut off to when they're discovered? Because I know that they were in Rochester Hills but, and then they were found in Detroit, but do you know what happened in between, where they were, where they tried to go? We, we don't, again, have a whole lot of their movements because the last time our detectives actually saw them physically in person was when we executed search warrants on the home when the child uh, in question was the suspect. So we were going to the house to seize anything of evidentiary value to the case at the school, the school shooting, and at that point um, there was no indication that the parents may or may not have been involved. It was uh, purely an execution of a search warrant for evidence related to the shooting. Um, that was the last time our detectives saw them. Um, as soon as the prosecutor gave some indication that there would be uh, potentially charges, our detectives began to do what we call a packet to prepare for if there are charges, where they might go, and began to do what we could to look for them short of what the expanded capabilities are when you have an actual warrant, either a search warrant or an arrest warrant. It's kind of an interesting situation with the whole family together in your jail. Um, do they get to talk <coughs> no. to their son? No talking, no communication. They're all three in isolation. Does that change over time? I mean, is no. Minor or no. No, on a variety of levels. First, we would segregate the male and female prisoners. Um, and secondly, we would segregate uh, juveniles charged as adult from adults. So on all three levels, they will never be interacting. Does the person who called 911 get the reward? Uh, so uh, my agency did offer a $10,000 reward for the capture of the fugitives. So um, if that person did come forward, give their name, and uh, we had subsequent information to get back in contact with them, they may be entitled to that reward. That comes through our headquarters office out of Washington, D.C. But ultimately, if, if the information they provided led to the arrest, which by all indications it did, that person would likely be entitled to a, a reward. How much do you speak about the conditions where the gunman is in right now? I know you mentioned isolation before, but any further details, how often they're meeting with counselors, check up what their actual cell conditions are like, anything like that? We're checking on them multiple times an hour. Um, you know, in terms of cell conditions, it's clearly uh, a basic environment for one person to be housed in, in uh, regular observational capabilities, um, regular discussions with our medical staff and our counseling staff to see if we need to do or change anything differently, but uh, constant verification and checks on them on behalf of our deputies. Can you describe his mental state at this point or if anything you can say? Well, again, we have nothing to lead us to believe that anybody has any mental health challenges so far based on records or information we've uncovered. Um, and, and again, as they came in through our intake process with our counselors and our uh, classification process, they indicate no interest or desire to hurt themselves. Yes? Two questions. Are they facing additional charges now because of what happened yesterday? And secondly, Chief White during the press <coughs> conference uh, at 3 this morning said that they were in a state of distress when officers reached them. Can you talk about that at all? Um, in terms of additional charges, again, the, you know, the form and fashion of where we ended up finding them and how they got there, that totality will be a determination by our prosecutor if there is any applicable extra charges or not, but I think um, certainly it lends to the original charge that if uh, there's no culpability, why would you go be in a warehouse in Detroit? Um, in terms of their distress, um, the Chief and I talked about that a, a bit, but I don't want to get too awfully into that. We don't, you know, I mean, it could be distress because they're caught or distress at the totality of the situation. Sure. Sheriff, some members of your department have expressed some frustration saying the prosecutor didn't let you know ahead of time these charges were coming. Was your department caught off guard by these charges? Well, we had, uh, we had some disconnect with the prosecutor's office and our chief investigators. Um, we've communicated and, and that's been um, handled and we're moving forward to focus on how we together, hand in glove, hold these individuals accountable.
Sheriff, uh, did Ethan know that his parents were charged, and what has his reaction or his demeanor been since uh, they've been captured and while they were, I guess, being searched for? What were what was his demeanor? Yeah. Uh, he hasn't said anything to us. Obviously, none of them are, are really communicating to a great extent with us. Uh, so, you know, his demeanor really hadn't changed. He wouldn't have been made aware that we're searching for his parents since he's in isolation, and mm -hmm. uh, it's not like we have a TV clicker in his hands. But does he know that his parents are in custody now? I mean, I honestly couldn't tell you. My, my guess is no. Um, it's not something we necessarily would go let him know. Sheriff, since he's under 16, is there some sort of mandatory education program that he'll be attending because of the compulsory education that he well, I mean, that's probably not the first thing on our priority list. Our first thing is to make sure he doesn't hurt himself and that he gets uh, timely court appearances and access to counsel. Uh, from that point, you know, other things are secondary. And on top of all of that, we have COVID procedures right now. So, you know, we have a lot more restrictions in terms of who comes in and out of our facility, how our educational programs can and cannot be conducted. Um, you know, to prevent mitigation and spread of the virus within a confined facility. It's not like we can widely social distance within, you know, a jail, so. Yeah, we see a lot of the focus has been on the parents because they were missing <coughs> on the run. Um, but would there also be an investigation into this, the school's actions? I mean, the prosecutor said that they sent uh, Ethan back to the classroom. He had the gun. Could that become part of the criminal investigation? Well, everything that happened from preceding to that point to after till we stand here today will be under investigation. And every tidbit that we learned will be handed over to our prosecutor for, again, follow-on charges if applicable. She has said that, you know, there may be other charges, and that will be, again, a charging determination by her as it relates to if any of the additional information we present her with rises to that level. Are any of the school officials under investigation? <clears throat> well, I, I wouldn't say a school official is under any investigation specifically. I would say the situation is, and if there's someone in that process, in that timeline, has done something that triggers that criminality, if you will, that's going to be up to the prosecutor. You know, anybody is going to be completely discussed, investigated, and determined what happened. And where it leads is where the facts take us. In regards to this person in Detroit, is it known yet what their relationship is to the couple, or at least what their relationship is to that building? We Yes, we do have indication of, of both of those things, but we're not getting too awfully deep into it until we get it completed and give it to the prosecutor. Sheriff, Chief White said that they were not armed. Correct. This morning. Uh, but we heard during the arraignment that they had taken out $4,000 in cash out of the ATM. Was that money found on them? Do you know anything about I, I don't have the inventory sheet on what was recovered at scene yet, um, so I, I can't answer that. Thanks. Yes. So, so a lot of people still have some questions about the, the school resource officer and the Oxford superintendent issued a detailed statement with so in it, he says the counselor made the decision to return Ethan to the class. Ethan explained that the drawing that he had was designing a video game. The question for you, Sheriff, is was a picture of the drawing taken by the teacher to the counselor so that the counselor would know? Because apparently Ethan had scratched over the most disturbing part. Yeah, you know, I'd have to, again, pull the actual investigative jacket to know what the counselor saw at the time, and that's part of the investigation. But Again, my, my reaction to the, the whole process is that if it was concerning to the teacher in the classroom enough ultimately to call in parents, at that point we would have loved to have been looped in. Thank you. Sure. The attorneys uh, for the parents said that what's been presented so far is that cherry picked with slanted. Obviously this investigation is still ongoing. There's a lot that we do not know. But does what has been released to the public now, does that paint a fairly complete and accurate representation of what happened here? Well, I certainly think that that's, you know, a part of the picture, and we're still, you know, 
finishing the, the, the picture, if you will, and we're filling in the details as we learn them and as we get additional facts. Um, but I, I certainly also believe that it's accurate. Yes and no, it's not going to happen. We have extensive video within the school of exactly what played out and how it played out, and that is evidence and will be uh, given to the prosecutor for the prosecution, and any viewing of that will be dependent on the prosecution as to not obviously prejudice uh, the case or any potential jury pool. Any estimate on how long you will process the crime scene? We're mostly done with the, the actual crime scene. We were in there till uh, I think I was there at about 2 in the morning. I think they were done about 3.30-ish. 5 30. 5 30, or excuse me, I'm losing my time hours because no one's sleeping. About 5.30 in the morning, the day after uh, most of our forensic examination, our crime scene team was done in there. And they're right now at the Oakland County Jail Facility. Correct. Right, right here on this campus. Right. And there's no plan to move them to another location for any other reason? Absolutely not. They're here, quite frankly, for the duration. <clears throat> so they post bond for at least the parents and them? If they post bond, yeah, they would be released. Anyone else? Um, sir, for the deputies who responded, how are they doing? You know, what kind of mental health uh, help have they gotten? Thank you. Um, I was actually going to bring that up. Um, you know, I ask our people to do some very dangerous and difficult things. And we talked about our response capabilities and how we've been training for years for active shooters and that I issue very clear instructions and orders. If I get to an active shooter first, I'm going in. If you get there first, you're going in. If we get there together, we're both going in, but we're going in. And our job, once we go in, and their job was, and they did it, was not just to go in, but to ignore everything else and go to the sound of the gunfire or the chaos because that's the active threat. Because if they stop anywhere to calm a teacher or a student or to render aid, more people could be killed. That's an incredibly unnatural act to walk past a child that's in panic and terror and may even be hurt, to ignore that because you hear chaos or gunshots and that's what they did and as a result when he was taken into custody there were some 18 unexpended rounds and that's what I keep reminding them 18 18 could have been 18 more kids that's difficult to take in so they're struggling in a big way and so we have had uh, a complete debrief for everybody that was at the scene all day yesterday and I went to every one of those sessions to talk to them, tell them how proud I am of them and that it's not weakness to ask for help and to get help, that it's important they do that. Their number one job is to make themselves come out of this process in a healthy way. It'll ne they'll never be the same. I mean, I was in the scene when there were still children there that were deceased. But those that were going in there when it was happening and they were having to go past them, devastating. And so we had a follow-on session today with some specialists that we had flown in. And we're going to do everything we can to help them um, to try to process this and to try to be able to move forward in a healthy way for themselves, for their family, and for the community. Because I told them that we need them to heal for themselves, their family, and community, but we also need them back out on the front line. I mean, the next day, our folks investigated a threat against a school and made an arrest for somebody that threatened another school. So there's no lack of need for our folks to be able to function well and, uh, and be able to deal with some of the future threats that we're going to face. And sadly, we're going to face more. I mean, we're inundated with threats right now. We have threats against the candlelight vigil last night. We had threats against uh, memorials. We have threats against individual deputies or law enforcement. It's absolutely absurd.
that after a tragedy we see a huge spike in threats, but that's what we're seeing. Can you brought up the headline vigil, and that was going to be my next question. Can, when you were there, can you talk about that? Because I interviewed somebody there on the scene that said there had been multiple threats. He was a retired police officer who was just there for his own well-being. And then, of course, it, the, the person who fainted collapsed. Was there any loud noise that, that prompted more? And, and can you also talk about the, the, the threats? Um, there was some specific but non-credible or non-verified threats that came in about that event in a different venue. Um, so obviously you saw a very heavy presence from our office, from um, the Village PD, from some of our uh, partners that were there in force. Our helicopter was above. Uh, we had REACT teams there. We felt confident we could and did keep it safe. But people are absolutely terrified. Their kids are terrified. And so what happened was somebody fell out, and we, we use that term because lots of times when our honor guard is at certain things, if you're standing in a certain way without shifting your weight, your blood uh, tends not to move and you can pass out, you can faint. So people in one corner, and I was on stage when it began, began to start screaming. And that panicked part of the crowd because they didn't know what they were screaming about. And that's when I took the microphone and said, calm down, relax, more people are going to get hurt by running. Nothing's going on. Nothing's wrong because that's how raw they are. And um, it's terrifying to so many people and it's really hurtful that more people are making these threats. And I'll, I'll put a punctuation on this again. If you make a threat, we're going to investigate it, even if it's not credible and even if you don't plan to carry it out. And if we find you, and we will find you, we will prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. And one of the possible penalties is up to 20 years. So it's not funny. It's not a way to get out of school. It's a crime. And you're hurting an already struggling community. No question. I mean, obviously, I was there as well, and um, I was giving out a lot of hugs before and after. And, you know, without almost exception, everybody that came up just was looking for some reassurance. And when we hugged, they were emotional. What do you have to say to the parents, Oxford parents, or parents of the victims, right. now that all three are in the county jail right now? That the intent is, and the plan is, and the anticipation is that the prosecutor and I are working hand in glove to hold them accountable. Now that uh, yesterday we heard a lot of details come out about this relationship between the parents and Ethan, and in the same respect, it's been days later since you executed the search warrant on the home. Have you at this point noticed or found any other evidence in the home, anything that would have pointed or indicated to this event happening, any sort of, any red flag? Well, again, I'm not going to get too awfully specific because we're transitioning to the trial portion, but as, as we have said and as the prosecutor said, we have clear evidence that this was premeditated and he was actually looking forward to it. Absolutely. And uh, I don't know if you were here for the other press conference we had about these unrelated threats and every police chief pretty much in the county um, was here. We are all united in doing everything we can to bring some calm, assure parents and, and students that we're going to be there, we're going to make the school safe, but we've got to get them back to some semblance of normalcy. Um, it's going to be difficult. And the same thing goes for students and teachers and parents. You're struggling with this. Find a path to get help, whether it's a chaplain or whether it's a priest or a rabbi or a, a, a counselor, whatever the case may be. Find a path to deal with this in a healthy fashion. Do you have any update on the health of the injured? 
Um, the last update, we'll put it out. The last update, most were improving pretty well. Um, but we'll, I'll check to see if there's anything new today. Can you go into any more detail as to the moment when officers encountered the shooter that day? Um, sure. There were two of our deputies that were moving down that hall together, seeking out the threat. And as they came into that hallway, they observed the subject, and he basically gave up. I'm not going to get too awfully specific, but he gave up. Did he give up as soon as he saw them? As they were approaching, um, he put his hands up. And, you know, I'll say this. You know, when we see most of these around the country, my opinion is these people are evil and they're cowards. They either typically usually give up or commit suicide. So as, they're, as the officers are walking in, and maybe you can speak a little <coughs> bit about this to their training, did, did the shooter have the gun, did he have the weapon in his hand? Did they notice the weapon in his hand? As they were approaching them, uh, the weapon was put to the ground and he put his hands up. I'm not going to get too awfully specific to the pre precursors and the postcursors on that, but... So there was no opportunity for, the, for them to even say, drop the weapon and then engage immediately? He, he gave up well, pretty much as soon as they, uh, one of the deputies you know, called out gun and he gave up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.